Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Cincinnati, everyone. Um, I'm sure many of you haven't been here before, and so I'm very excited that one of the first things you got to experience last night was our Union Terminal, which is such an impressive piece of architecture, and please explore the city while you're here. There's so many more where that came from. And then tell your friends. Come back. Spend some more time here. Don't tell too many people. <laughs> because we don't want to ruin what we have, which is the biggest small town in the country. But please tell your friends, it's a wonderful place to live. I chose to come back to Cincinnati to raise my family because it's a great place to be. And I just want to welcome all of you uh, to being here today. And I know my staff's already freaking out because I've gone completely off script. Um, <laughs> it only took me two seconds. Uh, but first, I want to thank, obviously, Nagara. Thank you for allowing me to come here and welcome you all to our city and our community. I want to thank the staff of the Hilton and Prestige Audiovisual uh, for being able to put this on. As I continue to go off script, one thing <laughs> about our city that has allowed us to fly under the radar is that we're geographically at this weird confluence of three states. So when anybody looks at numbers, we don't look that big. 300,000 people in the city of Cincinnati. The Hamilton County has 830,000 people. But as many of you have noticed, if you just look right across the river, you can walk to Kentucky in about 10 minutes. And you have hundreds of thousands of more people. Our region inclu includes three separate states, a metro region of almost 2 million people. Um, we've got a baseball team, a football team, a soccer team, the U.S. women's national team. After they win the next World Cup in a couple weeks, we'll be, their first game will be back in Cincinnati at TQL Stadium on American soil. And as a lifelong advocate for the city, that's just my additional way of saying, please come, please tell your friends. But anyways, on to what I was supposed to talk about. Uh, my name is Pavan Parikh, and I have the honor of serving as the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts uh, here in Cincinnati. And as you gather for this national convention, uh, on behalf of our office, the city, the county, and the entire region, we extend a warm welcome and express our excitement to have you in our beautiful home. Before we delve into the essence of our discussion today, let me ask, show of hands, quick, how many of you have been here before, Cincinnati? That is a lot more people than I thought. <laughs> okay, so we've made reference to the chili and then I heard a bunch of rumbling in the background. Um, don't think of it, for you Texas people, don't think of it as chili. <laughs> that's what's gonna get in your head and that's gonna, that's gonna mess with it. It's a delicious dish. Just think of it as pasta with the meat sauce on it and a giant mound of orange cheese. Uh, so I, I hope you get a chance to try that if you haven't. Uh, Oprah's favorite ice cream, Grater's Black Raspberry Chip. There's a Grater's right across the street on Fountain Square. I hope you can try that out as well. It's my personal favorite as well. It's about the only thing me and Oprah have in common. Um, <laughs> But, I, but we are here today to unveil some hidden facets of our city that you may not have heard before, even though many of you have spent some time here. These stories from our past have been preserved and were made known to us through the dedicated efforts of individuals like yourselves, government archivists and record administrators. As a Cincinnati native, I take great pride in our city, even though you know some of you seem a little split on our culinary contributions. Um, please try them before you leave here, though. Over the years, our city has captured the national attention for various reasons. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, our sports teams experienced their fair share of triumphs, uh, and then the 90s happened for the Bengals, and the 2000s happened for the Bengals. But the Bengals, Reds, and even our most recent team, MLS's FC Cincinnati, have experienced major headlines and major success once again. But it's not always good stories. Back in 2001, in the spring of 2001, the eyes of the world were on us during one of our most trying times, when our city experienced days and nights of civil unrest sparked by the tragic police shooting of Timothy Thomas, an unarmed black teenager. However, while this event tore the very fabric of our community apart, our commitment to each other helped us stitch us back together leading to the creation of the collaborative agreement, a model nationally and internationally in addressing racial discrimination and policing. Yet among all the stories that have made national headlines, some remarkable aspects of our city history, once the talk of the country, have faded into obscurity. Today I stand before you to shed some light on some of these forgotten narratives. When we learned that this conference would be held in Cincinnati, we knew it was an ideal opportunity to express our gratitude to each and every one of you in this room. 
Without your dedication and expertise, a wealth of knowledge, of historical knowledge, from all corners of the United States would be lost. Whether it's a student researching an old superior court case for a history paper, a family matriarch delving into domestic relations documents to learn about their genealogy, or a legislator examining a historic legislative record to shape current policy, none of this would be possible without your invaluable work. In the 1800s, Cincinnati proudly stood as the sixth largest city in the United States, akin to Philadelphia today. It was during this era that a significant riot occurred in 1884, resulting in the destruction and loss of hundreds of thousands of pages of historical documents when the county courthouse was burned down. Today, we embark on a journey through the annals of our city's history, discovering how we managed to piece together fragments of our past through recent and miraculous discovery the recovery of a trove of historical documents once thought destroyed, forever lost in that fire. As the Clerk of Courts of Hamilton County, my office holds the responsibility for records from our domestic relations, municipal, common pleas, and appeals courts. Additionally, we have assumed the role of de facto keepers of historical records from defunct courts throughout our city's history, such as the Superior Court of Cincinnati. We will further delve into this topic shortly, but for now, let us commence our exploration from the very beginning of our city's history. You heard in the land acknowledgement that before Cincinnati even became a town, the Shawnee and the Miami, along with other affiliated Algonquin-speaking tribes, originally inhabited this area, which was shrouded in dense forests. It has been said that a squirrel could have traveled from treetop to treetop from the Ohio River to where Dayton is today without touching the ground once. The city began actually as three separate settlements, Columbia, LaSanteville, and North Bend. In 1788, Matthias Denman, Colonel Robert Pattinson, and Israel Ludlow joined forces and purchased 800 acres of land along the Ohio River across from the mouth of the Licking River. Each played a vital role. Denman provided the funding, Patterson recruited settlers, and Ludlow surveyed the land and facilitated its sale, thereby establishing a town. With the arrival of 11 families and 24 men as settlers, the city was founded and originally named Losantaville. Losantaville, an odd composite of syllables from three languages, L for the licking, for the licking river. Os is Latin for mouth. Anti is Greek for opposite. And vil, or v, if you actually speak French, is French for town, meaning somehow in three languages amalgamated together, town opposite the licking river. The following year, in an effort to safeguard settlers from continuous Native American raids, the federal government established Fort Washington named in honor of George Washington. This fort served the entire Northwest Territory for the next five years and housed around 300 soldiers. In those early years, law and order were scarce. In an attempt to address this, settlers organized a court conducting proceedings, as we'll see a theme that recurs throughout Cincinnati history, in the bar room of a rented tavern situated on the banks of the Ohio River. In 1790, the settlement received its present name, Cincinnati. Under the guidance of Governor Arthur St. Clair, the then governor of the Northwest Territory, the city was named in honor of the Society of the Cincinnati, of which St. Clair served as president. The society derives its name from Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, the Roman general and citizen soldier who, having saved Rome, was offered the position of dictator, but declined and retired, retired quietly to his farm. Cincinnati experienced an influx of approximately 250 new families that year increasing the population to about 700. It was also in 1790 that Governor St. Clair established Hamilton County and made Cincinnati its seat of government. By 1795, the growing population had led to the establishment of various businesses, including furniture manufacturers, a butcher, a brewer, and even a French pastry chef. This population surge was driven largely by the Ohio River, serving as a superhighway for settlers entering the region on flatboats. With this rapid increase in population, the need for a permanent courthouse arose. In the same year, we believe that our first permanent courthouse was constructed. It stood at, the site, <clears throat> stood at the site now known as Government Square, just about a block away from where we gather today. Accounts of the time as to describe the location as virtually swampland and marshes, often referred to as the Frog Pond. A quote from, 19, from a 1921 writing vividly captures the scene. Quote, indeed, historical writers upon the old courthouse declared that the judicial business was transacted to music furnished by bullfrogs, end quote. Working in that building every day, some days I wonder if that might not be better. 
These are but the initial chapters of our city's captivating history. As we delve deeper, we will unravel remarkable tales and discover the pivotal role that government archivists and record keepers, uh, such as yourselves, play in preserving and unearthing the rich tapestry of our past. Cincinnati rose to prominence in the 19th century. It was during this century that Cincinnati earned the esteemed title of Porkopolis, becoming the leading meat processing center in the United States. As you walk around town, you may notice little flying pigs, little, that's a big thing here. Um, just go with it. <laughs> and if any of you are runners, please come back and run the fly, Flying Pig Marathon every May. It's an incredibly difficult race, but it's an incredibly good one. So if you, if you like to run marathons, that's another opportunity to come back and join us. Farmers flock to this bustling city, bringing their livestock for slaughter, processing, and sale. This thriving industry not only propelled Cincinnati commerce, but also garnered another moniker for the city, the Queen City. Who's from Charlotte? Sorry. <laughs> I figured there'd be at least one person. Local, local boosters first called it the Queen City or the Queen City of the West to promote local growth in both trade and settlers. In 1802, Hamilton County welcomed its second courthouse. The need for this courthouse, this new courthouse, arose from Cincinnati's population growth, as it emerged as Ohio's most important trading hub. However, tragedy struck in 1813 when this courthouse just succumbed to a devastating fire, a trend that unfortunately plagued several of our courthouses in subsequent years. The fire was attributed to careless soldiers who had used the structure as a barracks during the War of 1812. It's worth noting also that it was in 1803 that Ohio achieved statehood, and its constitution provided for the appointment of a clerk of courts in each county. However, it wouldn't be until 1851 that the office would become an elected position. Fast forward to 1819, when, and we will witness the completion of Cincinnati's third courthouse. It was in the same year that Cincinnati officially became an incorporated city, solidifying its place on the map. By 1820, the city boasted nearly 10,000 residents, a testament to its rapid growth and prosperity. The year 1825 marked a significant milestone with the construction of the Miami and Erie Canal. Once completed in 1845, this canal spanned an impressive 274 miles, connecting Cincinnati to Toledo. At its peak in 1855, the Ohio Canal System encompassed almost 1,000 miles. However, the rise of the rail system eventually led to the decline of canals. Ohio is actually the last state who built canals that did not go bankrupt. These artificial rivers were almost immediately eclipsed by rail competition. Cities that bet big on rail, like Chicago, continued to expand and grow, while canal cities would fall upon much harder times. It's essential to mention the vital role the canal played in shaping one of Cincinnati's most storied neighborhoods over the Rhine. This area, which we now refer to as a neighborhood, but wasn't referred to in that way until the 1800s, was demarcated by the canal and became known as Little Deutschland due to its large German immigrant population. Though not only inhabited by German immigrants, it was said that by passing over the canal or the Rhine, symbolized crossing into familiar territory for the city's German residents, making them feel more at home. Central Parkway, which, the wide boulevard, which is the wide boulevard that now forms the northern boundary of our current courthouse, is built on once was that canal. Throughout the early 1800s, Cincinnati played a vital role in the Underground Railroad, a network of safe houses hiding places that were in hiding places that aided enslaved people in their quest for freedom. It is estimated that over 40,000 individuals escaped slavery by crossing the Ohio River with Cincinnati as its crucial waypoint. The story of Margaret Garner, depicted in this painting, and the inspiration for Toni Morrison's Beloved, is rooted in this region and played out in the Hamilton County courts, though you won't find many court records from this time period, unfortunately. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, just down the street from here, on the northern bank of the Ohio River, documents much of the complex history of Cincinnati and the Underground Railroad, including the tensions that existed between previously enslaved people, those seeking appeasement with the South, and Irish immigrants competing for jobs. Violent confrontations erupted amongst these groups in 1829, 1836, and 1841, reflecting the complexities of the era. The museum, opened in 2004, sits in the heart of, once, of what was once called Little Africa, one of the early Black Riverfront communities. I encourage you to visit if you find some time this week, and I believe you will have a voucher in the back of your of your name tags for that. In 1831, 
a young attorney named Alfonso Taft arrived in Cincinnati to establish his law practice. Taft's impact on national politics as well as government cannot be overstated. From his humble beginnings as a judge on the Superior Court of Cincinnati to the founding of the Cincinnati Bar Association, Taft's journey led him to become the United States Secretary of War and the U.S. Attorney General. Most notably, he was the father of William Howard Taft, another Cincinnati native who you may have heard of before, once or twice. In 1841, another notable figure from Cincinnati's history, William Henry Harrison, was elected as the ninth president of the United States while serving as Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. Unfortunately, Harrison's presidency was cut tragically short as he passed away just 31 days after his inauguration. Um, for those of you Midwesterners, wear a coat in the winter. Pneumonia is not really worth it. I think we, should, we, we would have learned that by now. Uh, this, this event marked not only the shortest presidency in U.S. history, but also the first time a president died in office, sparking a mini constitutional crisis. Harrison also holds the distinction of being the last president born as a British subject in the 13 colonies. Remarkably, according to the White House Historical Association, there's only one other recorded instance in history of a county clerk of courts ascending to the presidency, which was President Calvin Coolidge. So while I have you all here, <laughs> this is a very important time for me to say to every single one of you that I'm really happy with my job. <laughs> Don't plan to go anywhere. So if you're expecting me to say something else, sorry. <laughs> During this period, as the pork processing industry flourished, companies began consolidating their operations, resulting in a combination of slaughter and packing processes. This transformation led to the production of inedible grease, salting and curing solutions and other byproducts, some of which could be used in soap production. In 1837, James Gamble, a soap maker, and his business partner, William Proctor, a candle maker, founded Proctor and Gamble in Cincinnati, creating an enduring legacy. And their world headquarters is also just about three blocks down the, wall, down the way. Sadly, the third courthouse fell victim to another fire in 1849, ignited by a nearby pork factory. In the years that followed, the courts and county operated from a temporary location a pork packing house. <laughs> You're seeing a theme here, right? These courthouse fires not only resulted in the loss of structures, but also led to the disappearance of records, including visual documentation of the courthouses themselves. To this day, there is ongoing debate regarding the photographs that survived, with uncertainties surrounding whether they depict the second or the third courthouse. Nevertheless, contemporaneous accounts from a century ago confirm the occurrence of these two fires. By the 1850s, Cincinnati had emerged as the sixth largest city in the nation based on population. Because of the influx of German-speaking immigrants from Central Europe, Irish immigrants fleeing the potato famine, and a sizable African-American community that was reluctant to move further north away from their families still held in bondage. Speaking of our beer, of our beer history, in 1853, Christian Moorline, a Bavarian immigrant, founded the Christian Moorline Brewing Company. This brewery, which flourished until its closure in 1919 due to prohibition, ranked among the 10 largest breweries in the U.S. by volume. The Cincinnati region during this period boasted an impressive 36 breweries, producing over 30 million gallons of beer. The production and storage methods employed by Cincinnati brewers using underground tunnels set them apart. German immigrants, adhering to the traditional brewing techniques and methods, produced a type of beer known as a lager, which required um, brewing and conditioning at low temperatures. Recently, we found a document in our, in our archives that included the original signature of Christian Moorline in the satisfaction of a court case, the origin of which we will reveal later in our story. I also highly recommend spending some time during your visit to taste our living brewery history and visit some of the many microbreweries around town. In 1861, our, our nation was embroiled in our civil war and Cincinnati played a vital role in this historic conflict. The city served as a crucial source of supplies and troops for the Union Army, and it served as the headquarters for much of the Department of the Ohio, tasked with defending the region. Given the earlier mentioned complexities facing Cincinnati, it was right at the dividing line between states that made slavery legal, such as Kentucky, and states that made it illegal, such as Ohio. But Ohio had also developed its black codes, that are known as racial segregation, to control black residents. 
Cincinnati's location on the Ohio River made it at risk to Confederate tax as well. Consequently, Camp Denison was established just 17 miles away from the city, accommodating up to 12,000 individuals at a time. Cincinnati was also one of the, tar the targets of Morgan's Raid, a Confederate incursion into, Northern, into Union states that covered over 1,000 miles. While the raid initially caused alarm in the North, it ultimately ended in failure. In 1862, the Black Brigade of Cincinnati, comprising 700 African-American men, played a pivotal role in defending the city. Initially, 400 men were rounded up in order to build a ring of fortifications in northern Kentucky that were anchored in Cincinnati to safeguard the city from possible southern attacks. One of the generals, General Wallace, was alarmed by reports of ongoing harsh treatment of the men, so he asked Judge William Martin Dixon to step in. Dixon allowed the four, approximately 400 men who had been seized to return to their homes and families in Cincinnati. He then asked them to prepare for continued service the next day. On the morning of September 5th, approximately 700 African-American men volunteer, voluntarily reported for duty. Their service marked the first military action by black men in the northern states. Many members of the Black Brigade of Cincinnati later served in the first African-American regiments organized in the north, such as the 54th and 55th Massachusetts, and the 127th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. For those of you who are fans of Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, or Matthew Broderick, you may recall the history of the 54th as portrayed by those men in the 1989 film Glory. You can view a monument to the Black Brigade of Cincinnati on the river at Smale Riverfront Park. The year 1862 also witnessed the completion of Cincinnati's fourth courthouse, an architectural gem known as the finest building in the West. Designed by the renowned architect Isaiah Rogers, the courthouse was complemented by Rogers' other notable creation, the Burnett House Hotel, which at this time stood as the largest hotel in the Midwest. As you can see, any conversation about Cincinnati history from the 1850s through today isn't complete without a mention of our achievements and arts of culture. As we conclude this segment, this chapter of the Queen City's history, we marvel at the city's resilience, progress, and cultural contributions. From flourishing industry to pivotal moments in the Civil War, the growth of arts and sports, and the establishment of iconic landmarks, Cincinnati continued to shape in its identity as a city steeped in history, diversity, and innovation. Sadly, in 1884, tragedy once again struck as the largest courthouse fire in Ohio's history consumed our beloved courthouse. <laughs> Not pork related this time. The events leading up to this catastrophic event are a story in themselves. On the night of March 28, 1884, Around 10,000 angry citizens marched from Cincinnati Music Hall, venting their frustration after a series of events by targeting the county jail. By the evening of March 29th, they had turned their wrath toward the courthouse, setting it ablaze. To comprehend the full magnitude of this tragedy, we must understand the underlying factors that led to such unrest. The riot was a culmination of years of corruption among politicians, soaring crime rates, abysmal labor conditions, and a profound lack of faith in the local judicial system. The Montreal Herald aptly noted that weak law enforcement had played a significant role in allowing such circumstances to fester. This was also the time that American cities were being reorganized into downtowns and residential suburbs, and that, had, and that the full impact of the long recession and the flowering of the factory system was reorganizing the nature of work. People no longer understood where they lived or where they worked. These underlying issues fueled disruption and violence all over America, such as the Chicago Haymarket riot in 1886. Concern with the crime wave was a way of expressing confusion. The incident's immediate trigger occurred on Christmas Eve, the previous year, when William Berner, a young white German, and his accomplice, Joe Palmer of mixed race, robbed and murdered their employer, William Kirk. After their arrest, jury selection process took an astounding 500 potential jurors before Berner's lawyer finally accepted the jury of 12. A lengthy trial in, ensued, and on March 26, 1884, the jury delivered a manslaughter verdict. This verdict outraged the community, particularly due to the testimony of witnesses who attested to Berner's admission of his premeditation and murderous act. The presiding judge, upon sentencing Berger, openly denounced the verdict as a damned outrage. Berner's accomplice was separately tried, convicted, and subsequently hanged. 
The riot was fueled by a volatile combination of oppressive working conditions, rampant crime, deep-rooted mistrust in the judiciary and law enforcement, and the highly controversial verdict. The New York Times reported that a juror had spent the night at a police station due to threats from a mob. Upon his return home, he encountered a crowd that threatened to hang him, but police intervened and dispersed the mob. Another juror was reportedly fired from their job when returning to work. Over 100 years' worth of government and legal records were incinerated in a single night. The courthouse at that time housed not only courtrooms, but also the offices of various county departments and the law library. Accounts tell of the Hamilton County recorder desperately tossing deed books out of the upper floor windows in a frantic attempt to salvage some records. And for those of you who last night were able to go down to the library at the museum center, you actually saw one of those books with its singed edges that was being tossed out of the courthouse. Recently, a fascinating discovery shed new light on the historical records of this period. A Hamilton County Commissioner's meeting minute book was found tucked away, it's not pork related, in a computer server room, maybe pork related, uh, containing entries copied from pages that had been preserved in a safe. These minutes were from the commissioner's meeting on March 29, 1884, the very day the courthouse was engulfed in flames. One entry stood out, providing a glimpse into the city's atmosphere during its final hours. Quote, Mr. Wabnitz moved that the superintendent be instructed to place the day and night watchman in the courthouse until relieved by this board. This record illustrates the concern of local officials, previously unknown to us until this discovery. In the aftermath of the riots, 300 militiamen arrived from Dayton, followed by an additional 425 reinforcements from Columbus, including a Gatling gun. Prior to the arrival of the Gatling gun, local gangs had, run, had looted gun shops, acquiring weapons and ammunition to, conf to confront the police and militia. The mob impeded firefighters' efforts to extinguish the flames, even halting fire engines on their way to the courthouse, toppling them and cutting the fire hoses. Tragedy unfolded over the course of several nights, leaving 56 people dead and over 300 injured. The local morgue quickly reached capacity, leading to the use of local drugstores to store the bodies. Among the prominent individuals who lost their lives during the riots was Captain John J. Desmond, a local attorney and officer in the Ohio National Guard. Captain Desmond, hailed as a hero and defender of the courthouse, was instantly killed by a gunshot to the head from a rioter's revolver. To this day, a solitary statue of Captain Desmond stands in the lobby of the Hamilton County Courthouse, a testament to his bravery and sacrifice. The fire of 1884 is also the historic event that ties us to you and brings me to you today. In early 2022, our office received an unusual request from a reference librarian at the Supreme Court of Ohio. The librarian sought information about an alleged case from a defunct Cincinnati court. However, the request provided minimal details, lacking even the names of the parties involved. All we were told was that this was a case that took place in the Superior Court of Cincinnati in 1869, presided over by Judge Alfonso Taft, and that it, it involved a dispute over whiskey, not pork. <laughs> Despite this scant information, the request intrigued Jason Alexander, our central services manager who oversees our archiving services, as well as the Hamilton County Records Commission, who first turned to a researcher's first line of defense, the internet, for further investigation. Remarkably, he stumbled upon three separate references to the, this mysterious case. What caught his attention was that both a bourbon and a whiskey writer from Kentucky and a whiskey writer from Australia mentioned the Superior Court of Cincinnati and Judge Alfonso Taft. Considering the obscurity of this court and the relative unfamiliarity of Judge Taft, even among local residents, these references led Jason to believe that there might be some validity to the existence of this case. Further intrigue arose from the tale that emerged, an account of Japan's growing infatuation with American whiskey, tainted by adulteration practices prevalent among American distilleries at the time. The story went that uh, the Japanese government, appalled by the harmful additives in the whiskey they received, analyzed a shipment and traced it back to a Cincinnati wholesaler. This revelation prompted Jason to focus his research on microfilm records, suspecting the case may have been filed by the country of Japan. He scoured the name indexes indices of the Superior Court and even extended his search to the mutilated record books, a reconstruction from the limited records that survived the courthouse fire of 1884. 
found nothing. Nevertheless, the compelling nature of this ghost whiskey case uh, refused to release its grip on Jason's mind, and undeterred, he embarked on an extensive six-week investigation, reaching out to 151 parties worldwide. He contacted whiskey and liquor trade associations, public and private libraries, governmental agencies in the United States and beyond, whiskey authors, and even former Ohio Governor Bob Taft, the great-great-grandson of Judge Alfonso Taft. Despite the thoroughness of his inquiries, no external sources, no external sources corroborated the existence of this case. As our search ended, we considered several theories. One possibility was that the case had been destroyed in the 1884 fire. However, the absence of any external references outside of the writings of the whiskey authors rendered this explanation implausible. We also entertain the notion that these authors may have confused a legal opinion and an executive decision with an actual legal ruling. Judge Alfonso Taft had indeed issued an opinion on whiskey in 1876, while President William Howard Taft, his son, issued an order on the classification of whiskey known as the Taft Decision in December 1909. The authors, being whiskey writers rather than legal experts, may have misconstrued these events as a legal ruling. After careful evaluation, we concluded that the weight of the evidence suggested that this case never existed. However, even in the absence of our elusive case, our investigation bore some remarkable fruits. Contrary to the belief that no court records had survived the fire, we made astonishing discoveries. One such find was an original document bearing the signature of Alfonso Taft from 1864, when he practiced law in Cincinnati before embarking on his political career. Equally astounding were the original signatures of John J. Desmond, the previously mentioned attorney national guard officer and defender of the courthouse who tragically lost his life in the fire of 1884. Additionally, we unearthed the previously unknown existence of Thomas Spooner, a Hamilton County clerk of courts in the 1850s, who we didn't know existed, through a surviving document. These extraordinary findings led us to speculate about their survival. Through diligent research and a quasi-forensic investigation, we traced a probable chain of custody that explained how these pre-fire, pre-riot documents endured. It seemed that these invaluable records had managed to escape destruction because they had been safeguarded in a secure vault that inexplicably remained unopened and unexamined for over a century. In conclusion, while the ghost whiskey case ultimately remained a specter, haunting our imaginations. Jason's exploration led us to unveil fascinating historical artifacts that shed light on Cincinnati's past. These unexpected discoveries remind us the significance of preserving and cherishing our collective heritage. As we return to Cincinnati's history, we arrive at the construction of the city's fifth courthouse. In 1887, the fifth courthouse stood tall, yet it replicated the physical dimensions of its predecessor. Regrettably, regrettably, this replication did not adequately serve the city's requirements as the population growth swiftly outpaced its capacity. Cincinnati had blossomed into a significant historical, cultural, political, literary, and educational center, not only in Ohio, but also in the entire United States by 1890. In fact, one newspaper even likened Cincinnati to the Paris of America, a moniker frequently bestowed upon the city between 1880 and 1910. With a population of 300,000, Cincinnati claimed the title of Ohio's largest city. It boasted the highest population density in the United States with an average of 37,143 people per square mile. That's our old public library. Unfortunately, guess what happened? <laughs> the city boasted around 130 newspapers and magazines and a library with a collection of over 80,000 books. Additionally, Cincinnati housed over 200 churches and five hospitals, cementing its status as a thriving metropolis. By 1893, a publication called The Illustrated Guide to Cincinnati listed a staggering 2,091 saloons in the Queen City. This equated to approximately one saloon for every 40 adult males in town. One of the most renowned establishments was Weilert's Cafe and Pavilion, a beer garden nestled in over the Rhine. Interestingly, it was an open secret that the Republican political boss, George Cox, also known as Boss Cox, ran the city from his table in this establishment. Many of these establishments operated seven days a week, 24 hours a day, catering to the diverse needs of the city's denizens. 
As the 19th century drew to a close, Cincinnati had not only flourished culturally and socially, but it also played a significant role in Ohio's governance. 13 of Ohio's governors had emerged from the city, leaving an indelible mark on the state's political landscape. The dawn of the 20th century saw the city embracing a new era filled with hope and progress. Cincinnati, with a population just shy of 326,000, was the 10th largest city in the nation at that time. This century will witness a wave of changes that would see a stalling of growth in a myriad of challenges and demonstrate a resilience that remains to this day. One prominent Cincinnati native who made his mark during the early part of the 20th century was William Howard Taft. In 1901, President William McKinley, also an Ohioan, appointed Taft as Governor General of the Philippines, setting the stage for his political and civic legacy. <laughs> Y'all know this story, right? Birthing an urban legend, rumors began swirling in 1908 that a 350-pound President Taft had found himself stuck in a bathtub. While there is no evidence, <laughs> no evidence to support this claim, the truth behind the incident is equally fascinating. The reality is that during Taft's re presidency, the White House received a bathtub so large, it was impossible for any president to become trapped in it. Shortly after the election, a warship captain carrying the president-elect to inspect the Panama Canal's construction requested a supersized bathtub capable of accommodating the heftiest man to ever occupy the Oval Office. Failing to find such a bathtub, a Manhattan company was specially commissioned to create the largest porcelain tub ever made for an individual. News publications of the time reported that similar spacious tubs were installed in the White House and on Taft's presidential yacht. In 1909, on March 4th, 1909, William Howard Taft took the oath of office as the 27th President of the United States. In that same year, Taft issued the executive order we previously discussed known as the Taft Decision. This decision settled years of debate over the definition of what is whiskey. After numerous congressional committee meetings and testimony, this ruling established the legal standard for whiskey, which still stands as a benchmark for the FDA today. In 1921, William Howard Taft assumed the role of the 10th Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, making him the only person in history to hold both titles of President and Chief Justice. Taft also played a crucial role in the construction of the current U.S. Supreme Court building, emphasizing the court's separation from Congress. He once remarked that being Chief Justice was the highlight of his career, stating, quote, I don't even remember that I ever was President. As a public reduced scrutiny on the Supreme Court today, we will again wrestle with the issues that plague Chief Justice Taft, during, including decisions around which cases to hear, the shadow docket, and, the, and legislative oversight of judicial operations. Upon his death in 1930, Taft became the first president to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Back in the Midwest in 1919, we proudly witnessed the completion of our sixth and current <laughs> Hamilton County Courthouse. This magnificent structure, built in with the 1884 riots still fresh in everyone's memory, stands as a testament to resilience and progress. With a cost of around $3 million, this Renaissance revival masterpiece showcases ionic columns constructed of New Hampshire granite. Not a single ounce of wood <laughs> was used in its internal structure. Reflected the county commissioner's unwavering commitment to creating a fireproof citadel. Three years prior, during the laying of the cornerstone, former President Taft graced the occasion, leaving his mark on the now complete structure. By 1920, our city's population surpassed 401,000 people, marking a significant milestone. At this time, prohibition began to strongly be felt in Cincinnati. Up to 50,000 people lost their jobs, highlighting the city's heavy reliance on alcohol production and consumption. Stories from that era paint a vivid picture of the drinking culture at the time. A fireman boasted of consuming 12 glasses of beer in the time it took to ring the fire bell 12 times. <laughs> meanwhile, workers, it's a different type of 12 alarm fire. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, the workers at breweries like Gambrin and Stock Brewing Company averaged 12 to 14 glasses of beer a day on the job. While those at Moorline consumed an astonishing 25 glasses daily. I'm hoping none of you tried to beat that last night. <laughs> or maybe I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> Prohibition, however, presented an opportune moment for George Remus, a former pharmacist and successful Chicago attorney. Recognizing the wealth of his bootlegging clients and the fact that Cincinnati had a significant share of the country's whiskey supply within a 300-mile radius, 
Remus seized the chance to exploit a medicinal loophole. He purchased distilleries and pharmaceutical companies, using the latter to obtain permits for withdrawing whiskey from the warehouses. His own men would then rob the trucks after leaving the warehouse, perpetuating that cycle uh, <laughs> uh, of reported theft. Dubbed the king of the bootleggers, Remus accumulated a fortune estimated at around $40 million and even inspired F. Scott Fitzgerald's portrayal of a bootlegger in The Great Gatsby. Notably, Remus defended himself in a murder trial against Charles Phelps Taft II, the son of President Taft, using the defense of temporary insanity. Astonishingly, the jury believed his plea and acquitted him, leading to his subsequent commitment to an insane asylum. This document, found from our archives, though not pertaining to this specific case, does contain the original signature of Charles Phelps Taft when he was a lawyer in private practice. These finds help connect us in the present to these stories that you could only read newspaper uh, accounts about or previously. With all the ups and downs of the 20th century in Cincinnati, our citizens continue to make waves in the world of arts and culture. Cincinnati's influence in art and music also extends to the birth of R&B. King Records was founded in 1943 and operated until 1975. Once the sixth largest record company in the country, it boasted a factory producing a million albums each month at its peak. James Brown, the label's best-selling artist, would park his luxury cars outside and even had his own office. King Records also made significant contributions to R&B music, showcasing talented artists such as Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, Roy Brown, Valerie Carr, Champion Jack Dupree, Ivory Joe Hunter, Joe Tex, Johnny Guitar Watson, and Otis Williams and the Charms. Notably, King Records holds the distinction of being Cincinnati's first racially integrated workplace. This weekend, for those of you who are sticking around, the heritage of black music in Cincinnati will be celebrated with the grand opening of a new educational and interactive tourist attraction between the stadiums on the Riverwalk called the Cincinnati Black Music Walk of Fame. So if you're still around, I encourage you to check that out. Cincinnati, like many American cities, faced challenges during the late 20th century. As populations grew in the suburban communities, the cities found themselves hollowing out. Once centers of community and commerce, the destruction of many once vibrant African-American communities through the construction of the interstate system and the growth of automobile culture drastically changed the footprints of many Midwestern cities. As downtowns became places only to go to work before returning to the outlying regions to live and play, cities like Cincinnati faced an inflection point. And for many years, the prognosis was bleak, punctuated by rising racial tension that combusted in our hometown during the civil unrest of 2001. But, as it had so many times before, our community came together to rise to the challenge of becoming a modern American city. We forged public-private partnerships to reinvigorate development in our urban basin. We built beautiful parks to encourage all Cincinnatians to interact with each other so that our children can play together. We built our streetcar that transports thousands of people a day around our urban core from the stadiums at the banks, past our courthouse, still standing, no pork fires, to Finley Market and over the Rhine for free. We continue to strive to seek equity in our resources and opportunities in housing, transportation, and business. I believe the new American Renaissance in the post-COVID era will not be centered on the coasts, but rather in the heartland, and Cincinnati plans to lead. And as this new history is written, we need all of you to do what you do best. Preserve the words the acts, the deeds of our citizens, of our government, and of our public-private partnerships. You have convened this gathering in a special place, not only in my heart, but in the history of our nation. As we conclude our journey through these fascinating, albeit abridged, history of Cincinnati, from stories of barricades at the courthouse, to fictional bourbon court cases, to urban legends of presidential bathtubs, I would like to emphasize the significance of your tireless efforts as government archivists and record keepers in preserving our collective heritage. Archivists, historians, and record keepers are the guardians of our pasts, the custodians of our memories, and the architects of our future. Everything we discuss today we know in our city's history, we know because someone wrote that history down. Someone preserved it. In a world that is constantly evolving, it is essential that we cherish 
and protect our history. Through your work, you ensure that the voices of the past are not forgotten, that the struggles and triumphs of those who came before us continue to resonate in our present, and that future generations will have a solid foundation from which to build. But why? Why is it important for you to persist in your profession, to overcome the challenges you face, which we already heard some of in increasing digitization, and to continue your vital work? First and foremost, history provides us with a sense of identity and belonging. It connects us to our roots, giving us a profound understanding of who we are as individuals, as a community, and as a society. Through the preservation and study of historical records, you enable us to grasp the complexities of our past, to learn from our predecessors, and to forge a stronger sense of cohesion and purpose as we navigate the present and shape the future. Archives also play a vital role in promoting transparency, accountability, and good governance. They ensure that the decisions made by our government and public institutions are documented and accessible to all. In an era where trust and integrity in public service are faltering, they must remain paramount. And the work of the people in this room helps foster a culture of openness, facilitating citizen engagement, and the protection of democratic principles. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the dedication and passion of you, the people who diligently undertake this noble profession. Your commitment to preserving our history, often working behind the scenes, is an act of service to society. And sometimes, you find yourself not just preserving history, but making some of it. As Arian mentioned earlier, even today, the genesis of quite possibly the most important criminal case in the history of our nation the criminal indictment of a former president was due to a request from the National Archives for the return of classified documents. It is your unwavering pursuit of accuracy, your commitment to meticulous preservation, and your tireless efforts to, to make historic materials accessible that breathe life into the stories of our past. It is because of the work that you do that tomorrow's first drafts of history of today can be accurate and complete. It has been my absolute honor to speak with you today, to welcome you to our city, and I thank you for your work as dedicated professionals who diligently protect and share our history. You do not merely, merely preserve artifacts and documents. You safeguard our collective memory. You empower our future generations, and you nurture a deep appreciation for the tapestry of human experience. Together, let us forge a future that acknowledges the past, embraces the present, and paves the way for a more enlightened and inclusive tomorrow. Thank you, and may the spirit of our shared history guide us on our journey.